Hi there, and welcome back to Storytime for Kids. I'm Mrs. McCurley, and today we are going to continue with our exciting story, The Snow Queen, by Hans Christian Andersen. Today is story the fourth, called A Prince and a Princess. Gerda had to rest herself again, and there, hopping over the road right in front of where she sat, was a large crow. For a long time it had sat and looked at her, with its head on one side, and now it said, Crow! Crow! Good day! Good day! It couldn't say it any better, but it meant very kindly by the little girl, and asked where she was going all alone in the wide world. The words all alone, Gerda understood very well, and felt how much they meant. So she told the crow all the story of her life and asked if he'd seen Kay. The crow nodded very thoughtfully and said, Abby, Abby. What, do you think that you have? The little girl cried and almost squeezed the crow to death. She kissed it so hard. Gently, gently, said the crow. I think it may be little Kay, but if so, he's quite forgotten you for the princess. Does he live with the princess? asked Gerda. Yes, listen, said the crow. But I find it so hard to talk your speech. If you can understand crow talk, I can tell you better. No, I haven't learned it, said Gerda. But Granny knew it, and knew pea talk too. I wish I'd learned it. Doesn't matter, said the crow. I'll tell you as well as I can, but I shall make a poor business of it. So it told what it knew. In the kingdom where we are now, there lives a princess who is exceedingly clever. Besides, she reads all the newspapers in the world and forgotten them again. She's so clever. The other day she was sitting on her throne, which isn't much fun after all, people say. And she happened to hum a song which was Hey ho for a husband. Why, there's something in that, she said. And she made up her mind to marry. Only she would have a husband who knew how to answer when you talked to him. One that didn't merely stand there and look distinguished. Ha, that's very dull. So she had all the court ladies drummed up. And when they heard what she wanted, they were delighted. I do like that, they said. We were just thinking something of the sort the other day. Now, you may be sure every word I'm telling you is true, said the crow. For I've got a sweetheart who is tame and goes everywhere about the palace. And she told me the whole thing. Of course, the sweetheart was a crow too. For crow seeks his mate, and always mates a crow. The newspapers came out immediately with a border of hearts and the princess's monogram. And you could read there how it was open to any good-looking young man to come up to the palace and speak with the princess. And the one that spoke so you could see he was at home there and talk the best, the princess would take him for a husband. Yes, indeed, said the crow. You may take it from me, as sure as I sit here. Ah, ah, ah. The people came streaming in. There was a crowd and a commotion, but nothing came of it. Either the first day or the second, they could all of them talk well enough while they were out in the street. Oh, but when they came in by the palace gate ah, 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 and saw the guards in silver, and footmen and gold all up the stairs. And the big halls all lighted up. They were flabbergasted. And when they stood in front of the throne where the princess was sitting, they couldn't think of anything to say. Grr, grr. But the last word she had said, grr, grr. and she didn't care about hearing that over again. It was just as if the people in there had got snuff into their stomachs and were stupefied till they got out onto the street again and they could talk 
there was a row of them reaching right away from the town gate to the palace. I went there myself to look at it, said the crow. They got hungry and thirsty too, but they got nothing from the palace, not even so much as a glass of lukewarm water. Some of the cleverest, to be sure, have brought a bit of bread and butter with them, but they didn't give their neighbors any. They thought to themselves, ha, just let him look hungry and that princess won't have him. But Kay, little Kay, asked Gerda, when did he come? Was he among all those people? Give me time, give me time. Now we are getting to him. It was the third day and there came a little fellow without a horse or carriage, marching quite cheerfully straight up to the palace. His eyes shone like a gems and he had lovely long hair, but his clothes were shabby. It was Kay, Gerda cried joyfully. Oh, then I found him. And she clapped her hands. He had a little bundle on his back the crow said. Ah, that must have been his sledge, said Gerda, for he went off with his sledge. It might quite well be that, said the crow. I didn't look very close at it, but I know from my tame sweetheart that when he came in at the palace gate and saw the lifeguards in silver and the footmen in gold all up the stairs, he wasn't in the least taken back, but nodded and said to them, it must be dull standing on the stairs. I'd sooner go in. The halls were shining with lights, with privy counselors and excellencies were walking barefoot and carrying golden dishes. It was enough to make anybody feel solemn. His boots creaked dreadfully aloud, but he wasn't frightened a bit. That's certainly Kay said Gerda. I know he'd got some new boots. I heard them creak in Granny's room. Yes, creak they did, said the crow. And as bold as could be, he walked straight into the princess, who was sitting on a pearl as big as a spinning wheel. And all the court ladies with their maids, and their maids' maids, and all the courtiers with their men, and their men's men, who keep a page, were stationed all around. And the nearer they stood to the door, the prouder they looked. The men's men's page, who always wears slippers, can hardly be looked at. He's so proud, standing there at the door. That must be frightening, said little Gerda. And yet Kay won the princess? If I hadn't been a crow, I'd have taken her myself, though I am engaged. He spoke, it seems, ever but as well as I do when I speak crow talk. So my tame sweetheart tells me he was cheerful and nice looking. He hadn't come courting at all, but only to hear the princess's conversation. And he thought well of it, and she thought well of him. Oh, yes, certainly it's Kay, said Gerda. He was clever. He knew mental arithmetic and fractions. Oh, won't you take me to the palace? It's easy enough to say that, said the crow, but how are we to manage it? I must talk to my tame sweetheart about it. She's sure to be able to advise us, for I must tell you that a little girl like you will never be allowed to come right in. Oh, yes, I shall, said Gerda. When Kay hears I'm here, he'll come out directly and fetch me. Well, wait here for me at the stile, said the crow, and put his head on one side and flew off. Only when it was dark did the crow come back. Rax, Rax, he said. She sends you her best compliments. And here's a small loaf for you, which she took from the kitchen. There's lots of bread there, and I'm sure you are hungry. It's not possible for you to get into the palace. Why, you're barefoot. And the guards in silver and the footmen in gold 
wouldn't allow it. But don't cry. You shall get in all the same. <laughs> My sweetheart knows a little back stair that leads to the bedroom. And she knows where she can get the key. They went into the garden, up the great avenue, where one leaf after another was falling. And when the lights in the palace were put out, one by one, the crow led little Gerda across to a back door that stood ajar. Oh, how Gerda's heart beat with anxiety and longing. She felt as if she was going to do something wrong. Yet all she wanted to know was if it was little Kay. Why, it must be he. She imagined so vividly his clever eyes and his long hair. She could actually see how he would smile when they were sitting at home beneath the roses. He would, of course, be overjoyed to see her and to hear what a long way she'd come for his sake. And how everyone at home had grieved when he didn't come back. How anxious and how glad she was. They were now at the stairs. A little lamp was burning in a stand. In the middle of the floor stood the tame crow, turning her head this way and that, contemplating Gerda, who curtsied as her grandmother had taught her to do. My betrothed has spoken most charmingly of you, my little lady, said the tame crow, and your biography, as we may call it, is also very touching. If you will take the lamp, I will lead the way. We shall go by the shortest way, where we shall meet no one. I think someone's coming after us, said Gerda. Something came rushing by, as it were shadows passing along the wall. Horses with fluttering manes and slender legs, huntsmen and lords and ladies on horseback. <laughs> They're only dreams, said the crow. They come and fetch the quality thoughts out to hunting, and it's a good thing. You can look them in bed all the better. Only, let me see, if you come to honor and distinction, that you bear a thankful heart. Oh, there's no use talking about that, said the crow from the forest. They now entered the first chamber, which was of rose red satin with worked flowers on the walls. Here, the dreams were already darting whoosh, whoosh, past them. But they went so quick that Gerda could not manage to see the quality. Each chamber was handsomer than the last. It was enough to bewilder anyone. And now they were in the bedchamber. The roof of this was made like a palm tree with leaves of glass, costly glass. And in the middle of the floor, there hung from a thick stem of gold two beds, each made to look like a lily flower. One was white, and in it lay the princess, and the other was red, and there it was that Gerda must look for Kay. She bent aside one of the red leaves, and there she saw a brown neck. Oh, it was Kay. She called his name aloud and held the lamp over him. The dreams dashed back into the room, galloping. Oh, he woke and turned his head and it wasn't little Kay. The prince was only like him in the neck, but he was young and handsome. And out of the white lily bed, the princess peeped and asked what was the matter. Then little Gerda burst into tears and told her whole story and all the crows had done for her. Poor little dear, said the prince and the princess, and they praised the crows and said they were not at all displeased with them, but all the same they mustn't do it again. Meanwhile, 
they should be rewarded. Would you like to go free? the princess asked. Or would you like a permanent situation as court crows with everything that's dropped in the kitchen? Both crows bowed and asked for permanent situations, for they had their old age in mind, and they said, It was a good thing to have something in store for the old man. That was their phrase. The prince got up and out of his bed and let Gerda sleep in it, and he couldn't have done more than that. She clasped her little hands and said, How kind people and animals are. And then she shut her eyes and slept deliciously. All the dreams came flying back, and now they looked like angels of God. And they were drawing a little sledge, and in it was Kay nodding to her. But it was all only dreams. And so it was gone again as soon as she woke up. Next day, she was dressed out in silk and velvet from top to toe and invited to stay at the palace and enjoy herself. But she begged only to have a little carriage and a horse and a pair of little boots, and she would drive out again into the wide world and find Kay. She was given boots and a muff, and she was dressed out very nicely. And when she was set off, a new carriage of pure gold drew up at the armor. The arms of the prince and princess shone like a star on it. The coachman and servants and outriders, they were outriders too, wore golden crowns. The prince and princess helped her into the carriage themselves and wished her the best of luck. The forest crow, who is now married, went with her for the first 12 miles, sitting beside her for he couldn't stand being driven backwards. The other crow stood in the doorway and flapped her wings. She couldn't come with them, for she was suffering from a headache since she had obtained a permanent situation and too much to eat. <laughs> Inside the coach had a provision of sugar twists. Mmm. And inside the seat was fruit and gingerbread nuts. Yummy. Goodbye! Goodbye! shouted the prince and princess. Little Gerda cried, and the crow cried, and so that was the hardest parting. He flew up into a tree and flapped his black wings as long as he could see the carriage that shone as bright as the sunshine. <laughs> And that's the end of story four from the Snow Queen. Be sure to subscribe. And until the next video, happy story time.